Welcome back to another episode of The Laws That Matter. I'm Carissa Kranz, and today I have a really exciting guest for you. I'm super excited to get to know her myself, Sarah Lee, a vegan model, an activist, mm -hmm. and yes, an animal whisperer. Sarah, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. So I just want to go right into this. How did you get your start as being an animal channeler, communicator, whisperer? Um, you know, I have just... I've just always been that way, but I did grow up in South Africa around a lot of different types of animals and rescuing a bunch of different types of animals. So um, although I have, I've always had like a, a different understanding with animals that I didn't realize like not everybody else had, but I also had the opportunity to, to rehabilitate and understand how trauma lies in animals. Um, and how you can like bring them out of that with communication with all different types of things um, so yeah that's how I it was always that way and then as I got older it became like stronger and stronger um, but I didn't quite understand it and eventually um, my mom actually had me go work with somebody that is like one of the most well-known animal communicators and once I worked with her I was like oh this is what this is like now i understand you know um and so i decided to just make it my career you know i've always my most the most important thing to me is um helping animals and uh i guess being a voice for them in a way so it so made complete you, sense what was, what was the first point in your life that you can remember where you felt like you had communication with an animal and we're receiving or downloading a message? Um, for as long as I can remember, to be honest. But as I got older, there was <clears throat> things that, that would like happen particularly, you know, and then I would like say them and then it would end up being what was happening, you know? So like, for example, um, when I was, I think I must've been like 10, maybe a bit younger. And I used to ride horses and I was like at the stable and the one day I was walking past this horse and I just had this image of this horse. There's like this image of this man like hurting this horse and then this there's like these green bottles around and I and the man I like knew. So I said to the horse trainer, but I was like so young, you know, and like at that time you don't know these things. But I said, I was like, I don't know why I just like get this. I feel like so-and-so is hurting this horse and I just like, I don't know why I keep like getting this picture in my head, but as a kid, like you just say it like that, you know, I didn't know what that meant. I thought that was normal to say th stuff like that. Um, and then they were like, Oh, that's so weird. Anyways, <clears throat> like a couple nights later, the man came to check on all the horses because some of them were sick and you had to check on them uh, in the middle of the night. And he actually found that man in the stable, with these like beer bottles that were green hurting the horse i'll just wow. put it that so way do you think it was like a psychic vision that you had or was it more of a, the horse communicating to you what was what was happening i mean that that is like um intuition either way you know so mm -hmm. <clears throat> the way i got it was more of like a an image in my mind um mm -hmm. but then it's up to me to now translate that information so sometimes it can be like a psychic prediction but i don't like to use the word psychic because i also believe that everybody has these abilities mm -hmm. um but sometimes it's just like the idea or the concept of the feeling of something and then it's up to me to recognize that and like translate it you know mm -hmm. and so, yeah. how how long have you been vegan i have been vegan six years um okay. yeah so and i haven't been you've been able to communicate with animals prior to the shift to veganism. Um, yeah, but I think there's, and the, what I've seen in myself and also in people that have gone vegan is if we're talking about vibration and energy, when you aren't con consuming lower vibrational foods, dead matter, because meat is dead, you can't, you can put a bean in the ground and it'll, it has all this information in life that it can grow more life. But if you put a slice of meat in the ground, you're not getting more life, it's dead. And when you start not consuming lower vibrational foods, you actually raise your vibration. That's just, that can be scientifically proven. Um, and so what I noticed in myself, but then also in people that went vegan is 
their intuition and their ability to feel more and be aware of more things around them was deepened. And for sure, when I cut out um, animal products, processed foods, alcohol, um, my intuition is much stronger. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like I like that. So you you had the ability before, but you strengthened your ability when you cut it out. For sure, for sure. And and when you get these messages, they come to you as images that you have to then translate. Is that how it comes to you? Um, most of the time. Sometimes it can be like I can hear something. Like sometimes I will hear somebody's voice. Um, but that's usually people, not animals. <laughs> and then um, or it's like the like an image. Like I will see something, but not with my own eyes. Like that's, I think what they talk about, like your third eye is like, you see this, um, but it's more like a concept of something. And then I have to break that down. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So mm -hmm. be before when you were eating meat, I mean, being yeah. vegan only, I mean, you've had this gift a, a long time, right? This, right. The skill, but you, you were eating meat. Did anything come to you while you were eating the animal on your plate? At time? Yeah, I mean, I, I cut out meat, but I didn't cut out dairy um, when I was, I was 10. Oh. Yeah, because it's been a long time. Um, I was like 10 or 11, I cut out meat because I was spending all my days with these animals, but then I would like go inside and eat an ostrich steak. And that wow. didn't make sense to me. It's like, I, I also wow. thought that it was quite weird to eat meat. Like growing up in South Africa, everybody eats meat. It's a big part of the culture. But I always found it quite strange. Like it is a weird thing. And everyone's like, I love animals, but everybody's eating meat. Um, but at the time, like at 10 years old, there was no social media back then. And I had never heard of the term vegan. But I also didn't have access to the information about like what happens in the dairy industry. You know, like nobody yeah. tells children that. They lie, they keep this information from the children and they that's the part that I hate. Um, but once I like saw a video about dairy and I was like, oh my God, I had no idea. It was like a no brainer to cut that out. You know, like nobody that says that they love animals and is like so connected to them um, should be eating them. It just doesn't make sense. I think it's a contradiction. Mm -hmm. And yeah. how, long have, how long have you been making a, a career out of being able to communicate with animals and act as a medium for others who are trying to get a message? Um, it's probably been like three or four years now, full on. Um, yeah, it's been a while. And how can people find you? They can find me on Instagram. Most of my clients come from, um, from Instagram. Um, so my Instagram is the Sarah Lee. And you can just like shoot me a DM or email me. Um, I am booked for the next two months, but you can just email me and I can schedule you for next year. Um, but yeah, from my videos, but if you're not watching my videos about animal communication, then you're probably watching my vegan meme videos that I make. <laughs> um, so. And um, what can people glean from your videos if they, what can they expect to see on your animal communication videos? Are you communicating with animals as an example? Or are you teaching people how to do it? Yeah, so it depends. So it's all of the above. So there's a lot of videos where I have recorded sessions um, and then post that so people can see what to expect. But the other part is talking about how you can actually communicate with your animals. Like people don't realize that 97% um, commun of communication is nonverbal anyway. So when you're telling your animal to sit or to eat or to not do that, like they're not understanding the English word. They're understanding the concept that's in your mind. And when we recognize that, we know that then you can portray more concepts just that same way. But we're not mm -hmm. trained to do that. People, they, they write it off as like, oh, that's so weird. Like, that's just mm -hmm. your imagination, whatever. But that is what communication is. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, a lot of explanations of that, a lot of explanations about how we can um, have a more holistic approach to rewiring trauma in animals, understanding that the way that trauma sits in a child is the exact same way that it would sit in a dog, for example. Um, because my thing is, is like, yes, I love having these clients and like, you know, having a career off of this, but my whole point is to equip everybody else so they don't have to keep coming to me, you know? Right. right. So, skills. Yeah. So people can, I'm very much a believer in that too. I think that we all have the access to certain, these intuitions or abilities or, you know, these connections with the universal energy evidence, whatever you want to call it. But yeah. that some of us are just a little bit more tuned in than others and tuned mm -hmm. in takes practice. 
totally it also requires the ability to tune out a lot of the other well exactly and chaos to tune in and listen so um and sometimes yeah. people just need tools they need teaching they need 100 percent. yeah and that's what I, like i firmly like everyone will be like oh but this is like so crazy that you're born with this and i'm like yeah but everybody's born with this but at some point we're told as a child like when we have an imaginary friend or whatever oh don't be silly oh don't be stupid it's just your mm -hmm. imagination and that that's all suppressed but it's still right. there you just for some reason i'm surprised i have no idea why that survived in me <laughs> um but it did and yeah once we like get rid of the ego there is so much happening mm -hmm. but we did rationalize you, everything did you have imaginary friends i did i had two of them <laughs> i i don't know if i did have imaginary <laughs> friends but i definitely was aware of every other thing around me you know um that you can't my mom, see my mom said that that's a sign of intelligence if you have imaginary friends for sure exactly and i just wish that like more adults like embrace that because i will always trust if a dog or a baby doesn't like somebody i will always trust their opinion because it's the truth mm -hmm. yeah you know? they're connected to source energy a lot of times and they're they're fresher on this world the longer we're here the more tainted we can become especially exactly. when we tune into the television networks these days and you have all that brain pollution um, oh my gosh across. you know when i like i don't watch the news like i never no. grew up watching like i don't know what you watch like fox or cnn and all of these yeah. things i never and then when there was the election i was at a friend's house and this like stuff was on the news and i was and it was like the first time that i was really watching any of this and i was like this is the it's weirdest so entertainment show i've ever seen like nobody is like everybody's talking about these numbers but nobody actually knows what they're talking about nothing is fact nothing is solid i was like why are we watching any of this it makes no sense mm -hmm. Yeah. No. Um, and I, I'm, I'm a lot like you, very intuitive. And if I have all that stuff tuned into my existence, it's very hard for me to tune into what I need to do in the creative mm -hmm. for this world. So um, quick fun fact. So my dad's coming to visit me for the Thanksgiving holiday. And yeah. I actually have today the maintenance guy in my building hooking up a Bluetooth headset to my TV so he can watch Fox and whatever oh, he wants and so I don't have to hear it. That's so <laughs> because funny. Because I can't, can't listen. I can't. It's like the TV's in the center of the house. I don't want to hear it. Yeah, no, no, no. I you can't. can't. It, it affects my ability to think and totally. to be productive as a person on this planet with the totally. things I want to do. To have, totally. Yeah. And some people like can't, some people cannot turn that off. Like I'm the same. I, I, I am so affected by certain things. There's nothing I can do. I can meditate until the cows come home. But if that thing is like in my brain, I can't, I can't focus. Mm -hmm. yeah. I also think you bring up an important point. Um, a lot of the most intuitive people are highly sensitive and are empaths. And I mm -hmm. think as a child, we're, we're taught, don't be so sensitive. And you're taught to grow thicker skin. And yeah, you're I hate that. To turn that off. When in reality, they say you're too sensitive, like it's a bad thing. But being when too it's sensitive, actually amazing. It's such a positive quality that needs to be embraced and nurtured because sensitivity mm -hmm. is a connection to emotions and feelings and compassion. Yeah, that yeah. It just needs to be channeled and nurtured. Yeah, and I wish like. Um... I wish children were nurtured in that way, you know, because the problem is, is that I see what I experience, but then also I see younger kids now, like I have a lot of parents reaching out to me because their children have like such sensitivity issues, but they know that their children are super intuitive, but they've got no idea how to manage it. Um, and, you know, the problem is, is that if you aren't, first of all, aware that you have this sensitivity or this ability, you have no idea how to control it. And so all of a sudden your days are just like, for example, when I was younger, I never had control over my day and the way that I would experience it because there was just suddenly, I would just be affected by so many things. But only once I worked with other people that have the same thing and understood like, okay, I actually have the choice. I choose when to turn this on and turn it off. Because otherwise I would go out into the street and I would just be bombarded with information and like, I would be exhausted and I would have all of the stuff going on. So, so now I have to like enter a session and then like, technically like switch it on um mm -hmm. and i just wish that that you know that these things were just like discussed 
with, you know, because we're born with these tools. Like we are, we come here to learn certain tools, like how to do break even charts and like tax and stuff. Like those are worldly tools that we need, but we also are born with tools. And why are those tools not worked on in school? Mm -hmm. We are all born with them. Like, why yeah. is it not something that's part of a curriculum? Why don't, why aren't we meditating? Why aren't we learning how to be in control of our minds and the way that we feel and raising our vibration and our, the, and our mm -hmm. feelings and all of those things? Yeah. Um, so that is my wish for the next generation. We should be taught those things in school, how to quiet our minds, because meditation is a practice. I always say that, you know, everything in life is practice, whether I was a, I'm a former professional ballet dancer, or a lawyer, it's all mm -hmm. the practice of ballet, the practice of law, the practice of meditation. It's all practice and being totally. able to connect with that higher energy source and that universal source requires practice. And the stronger, yeah. the more you practice, the stronger your connection becomes. Yeah. And the more you acknowledge the connection, the more excited the connection becomes because it's work, that's co-creation. It's working with you. Totally. To what you want. Totally. Yeah. Okay. And I think um, people like, I think maybe people just think I'd bounce around and get this information. It's not that I have to have so much discipline. I don't drink alcohol. I meditate for at least two hours a day before I even start any sessions. Like it's something that has continuously be worked because mm -hmm. unfortunately as human beings, we also have an ego and that ego can wreak havoc if you mm -hmm. don't have control over it. But if you're not taught to recognize that ego or recognize what's going on in your mind and you actually have the power to change it, then that's why we have all of these people running around stressed and wanting to do drugs because they, ha they have no control over, over their happiness, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. So did you meditate your two hours today? Are you ready to enter a session? Here, um, I'm going to have you enter meet my meat pumpkin. This is, this is sweet pumpkin. Cutie. So what do you need? She's four and a half years old. Do you need to see her? Yeah, I mean, so so this is how my like how I work. So I would get information from her. You would send it to me, and then I would go and do. I meditate on that specific animal for an hour, and then I'll write information, and then I would call you. Ah, yeah. So you get downloads. You have to meditate on it. Mm -hmm. Does anything come to mind with her? So pumpkin is a um, COVID companion oh my rescue God. i brought i got her at the end of june um, okay she um basically she's four and a half years old but i don't really know much about her prior life i know that she was dropped off at um shih tzu rescue of florida uh with an infected uterus and um she was pretty much on her deathbed mm -hmm. and they she had to have like a four thousand dollar surgery and then um, had a, oh my God. a long healing process. Um, and then, Shame, man. And then I, uh, I, I brought her home. I rescued her from, she was with like 80 other dogs though. I mean, oh my God, so she, I mean, I can only imagine what it would have been like for her to be, have a family for four years and then suddenly get dropped off and surrendered and to not talk about trauma. I mean, but I wouldn't know. She doesn't act very, she looks really tired now. I wouldn't know that she's been, um, she's such a good dog, but I do think yeah. she probably has abandonment issues. Yeah. But, I mean, for sure. I mean, if you, it's the same thing with, with kids, it's like these questions of like, well, why am I not good enough? Like, am I, is this going to happen again? Like all of those things come up. Yeah. The, the, but the other thing is, is that if you are clear with like, this is your home, um, they understand that like this is never going to happen again, but sometimes it can take a long time for them to truly believe it. The other thing is, is that people don't realize, and I've had so many clients this week with the same issue. When animals are put on, on medication or, ha or have to go under anesthetic, if we think about it on a physical level, that anesthetic literally, it has to be so strong in the body to, to put you into such a deep sleep, but not kill you, but allow you to not feel anything while like literally so much pain is like happening to your body in, in an operation. That stuff is so powerful. It literally changes all of the energy of an animal. And it takes like six months to a year for that to come out of the body. The same with human beings. And so like, it's very, so when animals come to me and they've like just had a surgery or whatever, their energy is like all over the place. It's finding its way back mm -hmm. because it just like wreaks havoc on the energetic um, system. But um, 
yeah, that's something to note. I definitely think I can email you some things, but um, definitely I would suggest a colloidal silver for her because especially at her age and like what's going going on, like the immune system is going to take a hit. Um, but yeah, I mean, you can email me some stuff and I can connect and see see what comes up. I should have done that before the show to give you give you a chance to share with the viewers. I know, but that's okay. <laughs> yeah. So what what's the most kind, uh, common types of questions that your clients have regarding animals? They yeah, up? it's usually, um, you know, like, are they happy? That's one of the things. Um, but uh, what are the most common questions? Yeah, like just checking in, making sure that they're happy. But then also, you know, I work with a lot of animals that have been severely abused. And then they have these, like... Um, negative behavioral systems that are linked to abuse so then it's my job to go in and then see like them show me what what that experience was only so that I can understand it so I can understand what their triggers are now it's like it's PTSD the way that we need to understand what our human triggers are it's the same with animals and then my job would be to understand that say okay so one of your main triggers is um, men in black coats hypothetically mm -hmm. or like um I don't know, pans crashing or whatever. And then I, it's like my job to now have them overcome that fear and um, attach a more positive outlook on that specific thing and rewind, take out the negative so that they don't have fear with those things. And then also, you know, building confidence, understanding like what else is going on. Sometimes people don't know what happened to their dog. And then if it, if it feels relevant to the animal, then they would show me an experience. But they'll only ever show me something that's relevant to now. Animals don't live in the past like human beings do, you know. Right. So, um, But then they also show me a lot of things about the people. Like I just had a, um, a dog show me. She, this woman had all these questions. And she wanted to know this and that. And then I connected with the animal. And the animal was like, all he would show me was this man sitting on this rocking chair coughing. Like, I can hear him coughing, like, so much. And it's almost mm -hmm. like he refuses to acknowledge the cough. So I'm like, hey, I'm so sorry. Like, I have nothing else to tell you. But, like, this dog is so worried about what I assume is your husband this terrible cough and it's like he won't get up and go fix it and she's like well that's crazy because we've been having so many fights because he refuses to go like check it out and I'm like listen your dog is so worried about it and it almost feels like there's like this window of time and he's not gonna have um grace with this like he's he's gonna learn a very harsh lesson if he continues to be so stubborn I was like I don't know your husband so this could be completely wrong but like he needs to go to the doctor tomorrow anyways they she went they forced him to go to the doctor and she just called me like two days ago and he actually has like full-blown lung cancer oh gosh um yeah and so um that's what the dog was showing me like there is this thing going on um and he just thought like oh it's just a cough it's just a cough but like the dog was like no you you are like gonna die if you don't get this sorted out you know so sometimes it can be about the people yeah i hope that he can get it sorted out yeah, I, um, I think it'll be fine. not a good one. Lung I know. Cancer, do they know what stage it's at? It's, it's, uh, like it's stage four. Yeah. 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 That's not good. Yeah. That's, bad. um, but let's pray. Hopefully he'll be fine. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I, I agree with you. Animals very much live in the now. I think mm -hmm. that I always, um, wonder when I drop, my dog off at the pet to get you know the groomer to get groomed how how she is when i leave because she's shaking she doesn't want me to go when i get there she's so excited to see me again yeah but they always say oh no she was fine when you were gone <laughs> out of sight out of mind I'm no, like, totally. oh. and they know what they like they don't particularly for example like she might not particularly want to go so she knows what might work to, to to let you know that like you need to, she needs to stay with you you know but then once you're gone that those that behavior doesn't work anymore mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. and i i do sometimes wonder if she misses her prior family but i guess she's in the now with me so she's not really thinking about them I mean, yeah, that's something that, um, like, I would have to look into, but it definitely is possible, you know, because that, like, your, our initial, even the same with children, like, your initial experience as a child is what informs you, you know, so 
Um, that definitely could be a thing. Um, but at the same time, like if that has been communicated to her that like you're in a better place now and you have this whole new brand new experience, like rewiring this thing, because the other thing is like you are their leader. So if you are saying like, oh, my God, I'm so sorry about what happened. They're so present. They're like, wait, why is my mom like like this? Like, oh, my God, what's happening? Why is she like saying I'm so sorry? You know, but mm -hmm. if you have this more positive, like forward looking um, perspective that yeah. that definitely has an effect on them. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, but it, it could be a energy. thing. I think yeah. like, I believe it's the same with children. Like I believe that like everything needs to be communicated clearly, like holding information from a child or a dog is the worst thing you can do. Like if you want to equip them to live fully and happily in this world, they need to mm -hmm. know the world that they're living in. Mm -hmm. You know, it's funny you say this, like I don't identify like you do as like an animal whisperer and communicator, but I've fostered animals in my past and every time I foster them and I'm driving them to their new home, I will have conversations with yeah, them you in have the car, to. You have telling to. them, but I'm talking in English out loud, but I'm yeah. telling them, oh, you're going to your forever home and this is going to be good great. Thing, yeah. And this is going to be great. And yeah. People think like that is so weird and crazy, mm -hmm. but like mm -hmm. if we look at the fundamentals, that is communication. Like people mm -hmm. are like, oh, but they don't understand you. Well, really? So then how, when you tell your dog to sit or you tell your dog that you love them and you and, like, I hear men saying this all the time. I will tell my dog that I love him. And he's like looking at me and it's almost like he's saying, I love you back. But they'll also mm -hmm. deny that dogs understand communication. I'm like, you just, you, you just acknowledge that they are receiving that information. Mm -hmm. um, so that, and that makes a huge difference. Like we communicate with concepts in our mind. Like when you are mm -hmm. saying, um, you're going to a favor home, like, what is it that you have in there in your mind that you're showing them? You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And that's the same way with like when people are stressed and they come into the home and they're like thinking about this like terrible woman at work. Like this happens all the time. And the dog will tell me something specific at, that's happening at work that's causing so much stress. But this dog has never actually seen this person in real life. But it's the information is so spot on. It's because this thing that this mom has in her mind that she's constantly playing in her mind while she's at home, like in the kitchen or whatever, the animal is receiving. That's what the communication is. And how do you know you're receiving it from the animal versus the person when you get the message? Because they show it to me from their perspective. Hmm. So sometimes, so like most of the times I will like, I'll meditate and then start the session. And then the first thing they'll show me is like them sitting down and like, looking at the door and the people will enter and then they'll show me the dynamic most of the time and then they'll show me from their perspective like watching like literally watching the mom walking in the kitchen mulling this thing over or like um yesterday i had a session and this dog was showing me the mom like in the house and she's like doing all these things in the house but she's like thinking about how she's not good enough and she's not able to do this like challenge on her own like it's been given to her and she can't do it and the dog is like but why do you think that about yourself you know but it's also like guides like you know there's all of this information happening and so then that's my job so then i go and i'm like hey listen you need to have more confidence in yourself like what is this project it's like this project has been given to you or it's like this thing like this this case that you have to like spend time on, but it's all up to you and you feel like you're not good enough. And she actually is like being put on, she's like, has to go against somebody in court. And, but it's like, she's all alone. And um, she like, she's like, has this fear that she's not going to be able to come out right on the other side because it's all her. And, mm -hmm. and I'm, the dog is like telling me like, no, you have the capability. Like this wouldn't have been given to you if you weren't capable to do it, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so it's all from their perspective. But we lost your audio a second there at the end. Oh, I think at your back. Oh, um, yeah, yeah, it's all from their perspective. Yeah. Um, so do you have any animals? Yes, I have my dog, Almond. He's sitting here in the sun. Can we see Almond? Um, let me get him quickly. Hold on. Almond and Pumpkin. Yes. I'd love to have them meet each other. I, this is a, so she's going to get her dog, Almond. And um, if anyone's just joining us, uh, Sarah is an animal Almond. communicator and a vegan activist. Almond, meet Pumpkin. Almond, say hi. <laughs> let me move this back. Let's see. Hi, little boy. <laughs> that is so cute. Amity, say hi, little boy. 
So funny. Yeah, so, so he, I rescued what's him. Story? Yeah. Um, and he was abandoned, but he was like chained up. Uh -huh. um and yeah he had like he was like the worst case like he couldn't walk by himself he didn't know how to eat he's so cute he didn't have any hair he had so many fears he always wanted to run away and um i actually thought i was like i know like i'm good with animals but i was even like i don't know if i can fix this dog but then i you know i was just at one day i was like you know what i have to do my best and if it doesn't work like i'll figure out another solution and i literally spent like a year and a half rewiring so many things in him now he is like a completely different dog he walks off leash with me everywhere he listens to everything wow. that i say he has no fears um how did you rewire him like met through meditation what what, what did you do yeah how so can, how can people rewire their dogs right or so animals so let's trauma? let's give an example so for example he had a terrible fear of men but only men with brown hair and this has something to do with where he he came from right like what happened to him um and so he would be he would well first of all he couldn't walk anywhere he was so scared but once i got past that point he was somewhat okay until there was a man around with brown hair or black hair if it was a blonde man he wouldn't have an issue but men with brown hair so now i believe in a little bit of tough love and i he has to see for himself that he can manage it i can't always say like it's okay it's okay he has to know it's okay mm -hmm. so i had to spend a lot of time making him like allowing men like that to approach him and earn his trust and over time and then like rewarding that that um confidence that he had and that strength that he had to like sit there and be like oh my god what's about to happen and then realize like oh it's actually okay and replace this perspective of men with brown hair with a positive experience but mm -hmm. you have to do that like continuously and continuously and continuously yeah. They're um, mm -hmm. yeah just replacing it's it's just like what you do with trauma and people like replacing that memory um what are some other things that we had to do? Um, is he your only, is Almond your only, your only pet? Yeah. Your only yeah. 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 That's a lucky animal you got. I know. <laughs> Why did Almond speak to you as opposed to all the other animals that you must, you know, receive messages from? It must be something about Almond. He, you know, I just got a message from one of my friends one day and I was like, she was like, I, she has a rescue and she's like, I have this dog. He just came to me today. I can't look after him. Um, I also like, don't know what to do with him. He's like so traumatized. Please, can you foster him? And I was like, actually, I just left my other job to do this full time. Like I have more time. Sure. And, um, yeah, he came to me. I was supposed to foster him, but it was a complete foster fail. <laughs> I like the foster failures. Um, I know they're the best, but it was a lot of work, like a lot of fear and, and things like that. But, um, it's been completely worth it. Yeah. He's yeah. so cute. Did we see him again? Minnie, come here. He is so Hi, cute. Little boy. He's so cute. He walks. And that's the other thing is like yeah. equipping them with independence. Like, he walks far better off leash than on because i'm and you know that's another thing is like you've got to be careful because if it's on a main road like that's probably not safe but um you know working off of them realizing that they can rely on themselves and you trust them like there has to be equal trust in order to have a good leadership role mm -hmm. both the leader and the person that's underneath the leader there has to be mutual trust and understanding and respect and that mm -hmm. takes time like that's the one issue that i have is like people will rescue or adopt animals and then they just immediately expect everything to be great but mm -hmm. animals have to also learn that you are trustworthy you know, it takes time. It's the same with people. If you get a foster child or a child that's been adopted and, and has experienced trauma, that child, even if it's really young, is going to take time to realize that, oh, I can trust this man. Mm -hmm. I can feel safe around this man. It's the same with animals. So we have a couple of comments here and questions. So yes. here's one. Give us some tips on how to better read our pets, understand them and their language yeah so like i just want to interrupt before you answer the question like i know like i get super stressed out right mm -hmm. i'm running a law firm i run a b veg a company i've got operations to i get stressed and my little pumpkin i swear she looks at me and she just looks 
with such love, but such worry. Like, mm -hmm. it's okay. Like, if she sees me in a heated whatever, she's like, mommy, calm down. Right. But how, and how do like, we read them? Like when you say tips? that, how do you know that? I find it so interesting when people, when people say that because that's exactly what's happening. But how do you know? I just it's, look into her eyes and I see it, I guess. Exactly. I just see it. Exactly. Like, and, I mean, but that is true. Like people will be like, oh, but that's so silly. Like, how would you know that? But that is true, what you're saying. And so that's what I say to people is like um, spending, you know, if you just quiet your mind, like not everything has to be in words. 97% mm -hmm. of communication is nonverbal. So if mm -hmm. you are, if you have an animal, like quiet your mind, take a second, stop with all the jibber jabber mm -hmm. and sit with your animal and see what comes up. And, and when these things come up, like people will say like, and especially like most of the time it's the men that are the skeptics mm -hmm. and they're always like, you know, they just like are so skeptical of what I do, but they're the same people that'll mm -hmm. be like, Oh, I feel like he's really homesick or I feel like he really doesn't like ca the carrots. And I'm mm -hmm. like, that's so specific. How do you know that? Out of all the things, if you sit with your animal and you're just quieting your mind and you're just seeing what comes up, which is what I tell people to do, out of all the things that your brain could formulate, why that thing? Because mm -hmm. that is the truth. That is the communication. So I always tell people, like, take that as the truth. Don't always, mm -hmm. we're so used to being like, oh, that's so silly. Like, oh, it's, so, it's a weird imagination. Like, mm -hmm. you know, but it's not. That's mm -hmm. the truth. Yeah. So, Yeah. Mm -hmm. I know that like in the past, I love cats too. And I've been, I've been a very good cat person. People say I'm like the cat whisperer because cats that no, don't normally like other humans always really like me. Mm -hmm. And I think that my, my whole thing with cats is that they sense when you're afraid of them. And when you give them that power and that control, they're gonna, they're gonna take advantage of that. They're gonna stay in control and keep totally. that power. But there, there were times like when I was fostering and they were like, oh, be careful, you know, uh, this, Benjamin was the cat's name. Benjamin's going to be a biter. And I was like, Benjamin's not going to be a biter. Oh, no, he's a biter, they would say. So I had Benjamin in my house. And every time Benjamin went to nip and bite, I would take my hand and I'd put it further into his mouth. And he'd yeah. be like, and he was so taken aback, like, yeah, reverse psychology. it's not working. My bite's not working anymore. She's not totally. afraid of it. And then totally. before you knew it, he was trying to like go like get a, get That's away from so my funny. hand. And he, he didn't bite me because he That's wasn't so afraid. Funny. He saw that it, it didn't work on me. I wasn't getting afraid of him. Right. But, uh, but if people approached him with a little bit of, oh, is he going to bite me? Oh, is he going to? Then suddenly he bites. Yeah. Because so he, he senses the, he's he, it's a communication. They sense totally. the energy of the fear. Totally. And also like, um, you know, what you're perceiving, like, why, why give that? Um, why say that about like something else? Like, why already give them that narrative? Like, oh, he's a biter. That's the first thing. The second thing is, is like, okay, yes, there is this understanding of communication. But then there's also the understanding of psychology and they're completely different things. The psychology and the domestication of cats is completely different to the psychology and domestication of dogs. And so this is where you have to marry these two things, you know, like, mm -hmm. yes, you have to work with intuition and compassion and all of these things, but we aren't one dimensional. We have a physical body. We have a emotional body. We have a mental body. We have a spiritual body and it takes a holistic approach. So sometimes people will contact me and they'll say like, Oh, they're having these health issues. And I can say like, well, I see this, 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 but this is a physical issue. They need to go to a vet. <clears throat> but sometimes mm -hmm. this dog will have severe anxiety and the vet is putting them on all this medication. And I'm like, well, it's not a medical issue. It's an emotional issue. So they need to come mm -hmm. to me. You know, mm -hmm. it's a matter of the individual. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so have you gone through trauma in your life to be able to identify with trauma so well? For sure. That's the only way that I understand how it lies in the body. <laughs> is that something you're willing to share? Um... I mean, I'm, I'm not going to go into specifics, but definitely as a child, I was able to see, um, learn from a young age how to study the intentions of people and the t intentions of somebody that's good versus bad, and also how to have control of my own mind. Um, and then also how, how trauma um, or ill intentions can manifest itself and, uh, you know, you're a product of your environment. So. Mm -hmm. 
inform you of how you view men, women, um, school systems, like whatever it is. And then, mm-hmm. and then realize having to do all that work for years, realize like those are just belief systems in your mind and you actually have the power to rewire those things. Um, that was huge, you know, like to not be a victim of what has happened to you. And so me experiencing that in myself and being able to recognize that in myself, I understand how that trauma lies in everybody else that's sentient because it's all the same thing. It doesn't matter if you have fur or you are human. Mm-hmm. Um, I want to answer another question because I think this is a question a lot of people want to know. So what do you, how do you discipline your pet basically without making the pet feel bad but teaching them their lesson? Yeah, so um, that's a good question. My main thing is making the communication clear. So I do not believe in fear-based um, discipline at all. I think that that does more harm than good. So like people that hit their dogs and stuff, even if it's a light tap, I don't believe in it because it's manifesting fear. But I do believe in clear communication. So from day one, like for example, when I got almond, the difference in my voice for good things and bad things and the overindulgence in positive reinforcement so they can recognize the difference between good and bad. So for an example, I wanted to teach Armin because when I was working with him to work, walk off leash and to trust him and myself, he kept on going onto the road. He wouldn't stay on the curb. And so every day he, we would be walking and he would be on the curb and I'd be like, oh my God, good boy, good boy. Like <laughs> overindulge it so many treats it's amazing it's amazing and then the minute that he would even look at the road i would change my tone of voice no like like low like no that's not good almond almond like so different and the minute that he turned back to go yay even now he's like looking at me like what did i do that's good it's the it's using your voice and the intention in your mind to to clearly communicate these things Mm -hmm. and I would love you to teach Pumpkin how to walk off a leash because she is such a wonderful dog. But that is the one thing that she just doesn't listen to me on. Like she will just and I I worry, you know, because she could go straight for a car. I mean, she just doesn't right. listen. But I should practice that. You should. Um, so I would suggest like I don't Are you you're in L.A., right? I'm in Florida. You're in Florida. Okay. So you can't be, you can't go to run in, but um, I would suggest like a park where you have to walk, not like a dog park where it's a, but if it's like a hike or something mm-hmm. and giving them no choice, that's how I taught Almond is giving him no choice, but to follow me because I'll just go. Of course I would never just leave him, but that's how I taught him is like it was safe. So there was no risk of cars or a danger to his life. But I put him off leash and actually they, they don't want to be without you. They need your guidance. And they also see that they benefit from listening to you. So mm-hmm. every time he would come to me or come back to me or follow me or come back when I called him, I'd give him a treat and like positive reinforcement. And then he wouldn't get that if he was going off on his own thing. And then he eventually realized over time and continuous practice that he benefits from continuing to look at the guidance from me. So now we'll walk and this is like, you should have seen him before this, like a mess, but now we will walk and he's continuously looking at guidance from me and he won't leave my side. Or is he looking for treats? No, I don't do treats anymore. He's not food (laughs) motivated anymore. I can't like, I can never get him to eat more than his like dinner. He doesn't even need breakfast. (laughs) Really? Yeah. He's not food motivated, unfortunately. Lucky for me, pumpkin's very food motivated. So I, I should try that. Put you some could. treats in my pocket. It's pumpkin. a tool. It really is a yeah. tool. Yeah. All right. So basically, bottom line is don't don't um, don't create fear in your dog to discipline them. But no, just be clear in the communication. Like this is the thing is they know that you and this is dogs have been domesticated this way that we are their leaders. They benefit from being around us and listening to us. They know that we are the ones that provide shelter, food, water, safety, um, love, all of those things. And they they know that, that's, that you are the person that they get that from. So they're not going to, they'll learn very quickly. Even if they try to be negligent with that, they will learn very quickly that they don't benefit from it that way. They look at us for guidance. So we have to just be clear with the communication. So how are farm animals any different? So... Farm animals have not been domesticated for the most part to live in a family unit. 
Mm-hmm. So their needs and their perspectives on humans are different because they they don't need anything. Like dogs are so domesticated, they, they need us mm-hmm. to survive for the most part. But mm-hmm. that's but that doesn't really mean anything when we're talking about the sentience of farm animals because every single sentient being, let's talk about cows, for example. A cow is a mother. They have maternal and paternal instincts. They have a natural system in them to become pregnant, carry a child, give birth to that child, um, gain a connection with that child. That's why um, their calves have to be taken from them earlier on because they Mm -hmm. gain such a connection with them that they end up like causing such havoc if their child has been taken from them, just the way a human mother would. Chickens, they teach calls to their babies before they've even hatched. So there's all of these maternal things going on. I didn't on. know that. Yeah. I didn't know that they teach calls to their babies before they hatch. Wow. Mm-hmm. They also, that's why the, the beaks, you know, in um, like the egg industry and the poultry industry, that's why the beaks are burnt off because the mothers protect their babies from the human beings. So we have just the way a human mother has all these maternal instincts and the need to protect and love and nurture. So does any other mother doesn't matter if it's a human or a cow and we see that in these common practices that have been put in place in the dairy and the poultry industry um to avoid these things Mm -hmm. um so so when i so now i know that a a cow has maternal instincts and experiences loss and trauma when her child is taken from her i know that i don't want to be a part of that industry because Mm -hmm. i would never do that to a human mother Mm -hmm. you know we you see you see um, mother cows mourning the loss of their babies all the time. You see that in horses, you see that in chickens, you see that in any sentient animal because they have maternal instincts. Mm-hmm. Because they're, they're sentient. They're oh, of fish. course. Of course. I mean, if you watch even my octopus teacher. Well, octopus you, are brilliant, yes. They're, they're brilliant, but, but, but fish too. You see them looking for their babies. There's, there's so, so much documentation about that. Yeah, I, um, this is an interesting conversation. So actually last night I was talking to someone who eats fish and is not a vegan and he had said something to me, which I need to look more into because I didn't really know how to respond. He said that fish eat their young fish will eat their own babies. Is that true? So I don't know anything about that? I don't know if it's all fish. Sorry, I'm just putting almond down, but I didn't know how to respond to that. I mean, that was a question that was, I normally have my answers pretty like, I mean, I, my response was that I'm like, fish have feelings, fish travel in schools. They have a sense of community. They want to be in their families. They travel in schools. That's why well, I mean, fish. But so then I didn't know how to respond to that. They eat their young. I mean, but that you know. like, to me, that's, that's just irrelevant. And here's why, because that is a fish's natural system. If a fish, it's the same with, when there's a run to the litter and the mother dog leaves the runt because the runt's gonna ha- not going to have a good chance of survival, right? So that doesn't mean now that I've got to go eat dogs. Right. That's a dog story to leave the runt. That's part of their um, their genetic makeup and their their psychology. It's the same with fish. If they're eating their young for whatever reason, that's a fish's story. But fish also provide and build homes to protect their young protect their young and their eggs from predators. Mm -hmm. They have these instincts to protect their families and their loved ones. That is true. You can go look at that on the Mm -hmm. internet wherever you want. So just because at some point part of a fish's makeup is to eat their eggs at some point um, doesn't mean now I have to go eat fish. Why do, why do right. I have to make it about me as a human being? It's got nothing right. to do with me. Well, they're looking for excuses and reasons to justify well, exactly. their behavior. And sometimes I'm not usually caught off guard because lots of times it's the same questions and answers. But mm-hmm. I was caught off guard with that one. I think yeah. I handled it right when I said they travel in schools and they have a sense of community and and they sense fear. Like if you're snorkeling and you see a fish and you go up to it, it's going to go the other way. Well, exactly. Fear. But I mean, if we can see, if we can know that this is a scientific fact, that a fish creates a home and protects its babies from predators, we know that it has maternal or paternal instincts. That's a scientific Mm -hmm. fact. So if I know that something has such sentience to have those instincts, Mm -hmm. then I recognize that it's sentient. So why would I then cause harm to that thing? Mm -hmm. 
Well, Sarah, I've truly loved this conversation. I don't even want it to end. I feel like I could talk to you for a really long time because you have so much wisdom to share. Um, is there anything, you know, that I haven't asked you that you'd like to discuss or anything else? Um, yeah, I mean, I think like, okay, besides what I do professionally, equipping people in the home, my, my other biggest thing is like for people to equip themselves with knowledge to know how we can do better. We're not living in, as cavemen anymore where we had to go out and like hunt animals and live off the land. Like we're living in 2020 and none of that stuff is necessary anymore if we look at this at the way that the world is. And so I just urge everybody to, I mean, I have an ebook on my Instagram, but also this information is everywhere. Equip yourself with the knowledge of what happens to animals and what is common practice in 2020. Because I don't believe that human beings are um, inherently bad. I, I believe that we have compassion and empathy naturally as human beings. And when we learn, because this information has been kept from us, but when we learn actually what goes into the production of dairy, what goes into the production of poultry and fish and all of these things, when you take that information that's been hidden from you, your mind will be changed on whether you want to consume those things anymore. Not only is it a less compassionate choice to consume animals, but it is also not necessary anymore. Mm -hmm. So I would just urge people to get all of the information that you need to do, to do better, just the way that I had to, you know? I love that. And on that note, it's a perfect segue into the next part of our show where we talk about every week we highlight a vegan certified brand by my company, BeVeg. And it's all about what goes into the products and the ingredients and the oh, process. Amazing. It's very much, I think, goes into karma too, right? You want to have, you know, you're talking about, you know, lots of times we talk about vegan certification for truth and transparency for the consumer. But I think you really bring up important higher level consciousness thinking when it comes into the components of whatever product is on the market because it right. goes to karma what what's the makeup it's energy um you yeah had, exactly yeah you had said something about when you eat dead matter that well yeah. yeah and in the so i released an ebook that's called how to live with more compassion and i went into the different arguments as to you know, um, on a nutritional level, on an energetic level, spiritual level, you know, um, a farming level, all these things. I did so much information, um, so much research on, on the difference in vibration and frequency in different foods. And I went so deep into it, it was so mind blowing. And the frequency of uh, the, the, the food that has the lowest frequency is animal products and processed mm -hmm. foods. Then we have like a middle frequency as a human being but vegetables and fruits have a much higher frequency. And then in quantum physics, they say that if you, if a, something of a lower frequency consumes or absorbs that of a higher frequency, that, that thing of that higher frequency actually raises the frequency and the vibration of that of lower. Mm -hmm. So, and so by, by knowing that as science, we know that consuming something of high, high frequency, like a whole food plant-based diet and mm -hmm. our products, we are literally raising our vibration. It sounds hippie, mm -hmm. but it's actually scientifically true. No, it doesn't true. sound hippie. I think anyone you know? that is aware and on a path of, of spirituality and awareness is aware enough to know, and even if they're not on a path of spirituality, if you're a human being, you are aware enough to know that when you are around people in your life mm -hmm. that are vibrating at a higher level, they bring you up or they bring you down. And that's so. why it's important that we choose our inner circle very carefully and wisely because those people determine how you are actually operating and vibrating in this world and what you can accomplish because so. vibrations will limit you or it will, it'll cause a, a, a great expanse. And that goes exactly. down to the, the food on your plate or the cosmetics that you wear or the ingredients in a mm -hmm. product, which is you know, like I said, the perfect segue to the next part portion. Yes. And I really don't want to let you go because I'm having so much fun talking with you, but I have no, to. No, thank so, you for having me. Um, I would love to keep in touch and anyone can, um, it looks like your book is on your website, the mm -hmm. .com, And um, I would love to stay in touch and I'll maybe reach out to you regarding pumpkin for some yeah. thoughts. So, so sure. I can know, I can know, I can know more about her feelings, but beyond yeah. what I see in her eyes. And I love that you want to know more, you know? <laughs> All right, Sarah. Well, thank you so much for your time and your energy. And I hope to have you back here soon one day. Yes. Thank you for having me. Have a great week and happy Thanksgiving. Yes. Happy Thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. Happy Tofu Day. Oh, yes. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs>
Now for the next portion of the segment, every every week we highlight a vegan certified brand of the week, and we have some breaking news here with BVEG. We just got our 17067 ISO accreditation. That's in addition to 17065. That means that not only are we the first and only accredited vegan standard in the world to certify um, products that is recognized by the World Accreditation Forum, but now we actually have the standard that is built, which certification globe, bodies globally can use and be trained on. It's quite comprehensive. Auditors can be trained on it, et cetera. And we got our official letter on Friday saying that we are now recognized as a standard which certification bodies can be trained on and use. So it's really exciting news. And one of our um, certified vegan brands is here today. Uh, hi, Angel in Spain. Thank you for joining me. I don't know if we can hear your audio, but I wanted to give you a chance to give us a little bit of history about your product, your region, and why vegan certification matters to you. Uh, we don't have audio. I can't hear you. Excuse me. Yes, now, okay. Oh, there you go. Now we can hear okay. you. So yeah, I just wanted to give you an opportunity to tell us about your your company, your region, you know, ingredients, why it's important to you, vegan certification. Yes, uh, we have a company with a long uh, history because our company was founded in 1883, more than 137 years. It's the second family wow. and the third generation of our family in the in the company. We are located in the south of Europe, in the Pyrenees, in the border between uh, Catalonia in Spain and France. Uh, our products are uh, connected with called ratafia in Catalan are called with the tradition of picking and collecting uh, botanicals and plants the night of St. George. A very old tradition here in Catalonia. And uh, our products uh, at this moment are, are very popular with the young people in, in our country. And uh, is this we, we want to, to have this certification, the vegan certification, because it's a difference with the other producers here, in, in they, they are uh, 16 producers uh, in our country, but uh, uh, there is a lot of marks, uh, different marks, different, different products made by these 16, uh, 16 producers. And uh, with the, the vegan certification, we have a difference because there is no, no other people with this certification. And to us, it's very important. Uh, we know our products were, were vegan, but at this moment, it's someone uh, with uh, authority to certificate this, that this is, this is right. Okay? Right. And I want to explain also other things uh, connected with our mark because um, my father registered the mark Ryers. Ryers is timber raftsman in English. And we connect with this uh, tradition of transport timbers by the river because my grandfather dedicated his life to transport timber from the Pyrenees to the Mediterranean Sea uh, using the, the, the rivers of our country. And we, we have connected these two traditions, picking botanicals by St. John's Night and to transport timbers, timber by the rivers. Mm -hmm. I think it's very important that people understand also, they, a lot of people don't realize what could and could not be vegan. So just so I'm going to enlighten us because it's an education process that the Tobacco and Trade Bureau says that there's close to 70 ingredients that could go into making um, a, a beverage. And none of that is has any disclosure laws requiring it except for the alcohol content and the government warnings. And that there is a very common clarification and filtration process that goes through, that happens with beverages, whether it's whether it's wine, beer, liqueur, or juice. Even juice and coffee, every beverage, unless it's unfiltered, 
has a filtration clarification process that always needs to be looked into and vetted. And the laws do not require disclosure of that. So um, it's important for transparency and truth. So I'm so happy that you have this history with your company and that you see you're also forward thinking with your company to realize the importance of having a truthful and honest vegan claim. Okay. Yeah. Yes. So, uh, it was, I, I say to us, to us it's important because it's a very great difference with the other with the other productors and someone has certificate what we thought we, we were we were making because we, we know we were vegan but uh, mm -hmm. someone must to, to certificate this okay mm -hmm. yeah um, any final thoughts? Not uh, to to invite other people to 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 make the, the same the same way we we have uh, we have made because I think the the wall goes uh, to this uh, to this way and it's important to obtain these certifications in order to 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 put uh, more high the, the the different the different products. Okay. Well, Angel, thank you so much for your time and for sharing your brand. And where can people find your brand? Where what? can people Excuse where me? can people where can people find your product? Uh, our products uh, must be uh, if people enter in in Amazon, for example, uh, this this level uh, you you can. Uh, obtain there, and if not, to enter in our in our website, and we will contact with them. And if there is someone interesting in this other part of the Atlantic Ocean to distribute our products, uh, you must think uh, different of our products have won medals in different contests in uh, San Francisco and in Los Angeles. I think it's important. If someone is interested to contact with us and through you, for example, you can give them the contact and we are, we are uh, interested and we, we can continue and to, to, to establish some, some relationship with people in, in, in this other part of, of the Atlantic Ocean. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much for joining us on my time zone. I know it's later there and our show is coming to a close. So, um, we will definitely put up your link on our website and send everyone to it. And, um, you know, congratulations on your vegan certification. And um, for everyone else, thank you for joining us for another week of the Laws That Matter. We'll be back next week, same time, same place on Jane Unchained News Network at noon Eastern Standard Time on Wednesdays.